As another example, uh, a study by, and I'm going to mispronounce this, Raghuram Rajan, who was then the IMF's chief economist, and Julie Wolf of your own Wharton School, uh, looked at how more than 300 big companies allocated executive perks, the much maligned perquisites, uh, during the period 1986 to 1999. And it turned out that they didn't find a correlation between perks and corporate governance. That is to say, if the bevchuk fried hypothesis was correct, one would expect to see that firms with weak corporate governance would have more generous executive perks, but they didn't find such a correlation. What they found instead was that perks are a cheap way to boost executive productivity. Firms based in places where it took a long time to commute are more likely to give the boss a chauffeured limousine. Firms that are located a long way from a major airport are more likely to have a corporate jet. In other words, they found executive perks seem to be set largely, not entirely, you know, there are $7,000 shower curtains, but largely executive perks were being set with shareholder interests in mind. In sum, the evidence simply does not support the managerial model on which H.R. 1257 rests. To the contrary, there's an argument that executive pay is reasonably well linked to performance. And put simply, H.R. 1257 is attacking a problem that doesn't exist, or at least doesn't exist anymore. Stephen, the economist Stephen Kaplan has calculated that for firms in the S&P 500, average chief executive compensation peaked in 2000 and has since fallen by about a third in real terms. Uh, and so, typical of our government, once again, you know, we seem to be closing the door after the horse is gone, or whatever the appropriate metaphor is. And I'll close this section of my remarks with um, a quote from Fortune Magazine's Dominic uh, Basulta, who, who took a really contrarian position on all this. He argued that there's evidence that CEOs are not being paid too much, but are being paid too little. Not only do the top managers of multi-billion dollar corporations earn less than basketball players, they're also outpaced in compensation by financial impresarios and Wall Street and private hedge funds. Should we care? Yes, he says. If other positions pay more, then the best and brightest minds will be drawn away from running major businesses to pursuits that may not be as socially useful, if not the basketball court, indeed I I don't think I've ever met a Fortune 500 CEO who I thought could run an NBA fast break. But if not to the basketball court, then perhaps to money management. Now I concede that's not completely explanatory. There are any number of us on the panel who could probably make more in money management than, than in what we do. But I think his point is well taken. In any event, if there is an executive compensation crisis, arguendo, is a federal solution appropriate? We live in an era of creeping federalization of corporate law. And I was interested to note, um, I can't tell you the number of Delaware lawyers who read my blog who sent me links to a news journal article last week, I guess it was, uh, in which basically if you believe my good friend Charles Elson, um, the sky is falling and Delaware is about to go out of business. He quoted Harvard Law Professor Mark Rowe as saying, if I was a Delaware lawyer, Sarbanes-Oxley would make me wary that there's a renewed chance the things I do for a living could move to Washington. Now, I don't think that the federal government will, in my lifetime, adopt a federal law of incorporations. But what I do think Delaware faces is the death by a thousand cuts. That is, gradual federalization of various areas. Every time there's a crisis, we will federalize something new. And the latest candidate, of course, is Say on Pay. Now, Say on Pay is only one of a number of candidates uh, for um, executive compensation or for federalization. Uh, majority voting, shareholder access to the ballot, these are all issues that are pending. And so it's maybe worth spending a little bit of time revisiting the familiar debate uh, over federal incorporation. 
The proponents of federalization would have us believe that the federal government can do a better job of regulating corporate governance than can Delaware. And this debate, of course, goes back as far as William Carey's famous law review article in Yale in 1974, advancing the so-called race to the bottom hypothesis in which Delaware is leading a race to the bottom of corporate governance standards. But basic economic common sense tells us that investors will not purchase, or at least not pay as much, for securities of firms that are incorporated in states that cater too excessively to management. Lenders will not lend to such firms without compensation for the risks that are posed by the lack of management accountability. As a result, those firms' cost of capital will rise while their earnings will fall. Management thus has incentives to incorporate the business in states offering rules preferred by investors. And competition for franchise taxes should thus prevent states from adopting rules that are excessively pro-management. Now, this is another area. Harvey said that the executive compensation area is an area where, you know, uh, numbers are soft. And this is certainly an area where you can cite studies on both sides. Um, but I think the evidence is pretty good that state competition has been generally beneficial. There are, of course, uh, a number of event studies, most famously by Roberto Romano, looking at firms that reincorporate in Delaware. And Romano finds that, generally speaking, such reincorporations are associated with cumulative abnormal positive returns, which is the financial economist's way of saying that shareholders liked it, that it produced a higher share price. Now, according to um, uh, the event study, rather, I should say, the event study's findings, I think, are buttressed by a rather well-known study by Robert Daines in which he compared the Tobin skew of Delaware and non-Delaware corporations. And Daines found that Delaware corporations in the period 1981 to 1996 had a higher Tobin skew than those of non-Delaware corporations, which suggested there is a Delaware effect uh, increasing shareholder uh, and firm wealth. Now, it's certainly true that some associates of Lucian Bebchuk have argued that you can't replicate these results, or at least that you can't replicate them for all time periods. But nevertheless, it is, I think, another piece of evidence that's consistent with the argument that uh, the race is a race to the top rather than a race to the bottom. Finally, look at anti-takeover legislation, which is generally singled out by folks like our friend Lucian Bebchuk as being sort of the worst example of how states uh, favor management over investors. Well, Delaware has a modest state anti-takeover statute. Indeed, a study by Harvard's John Coates confirms that the Delaware takeover statute is the least restrictive takeover statute uh, on the books. Taken together, the totality of the evidence, to my mind, suggests that state competition for charters has been a generally beneficial process. And that therefore, incorporation at the state level and state dominance of corporate governance has been generally positive. Why should it be generally positive? What is the process that is at work here? Well, uh, Roberto Romano calls it competitive federalism, but the idea goes back to Louis Brandeis's famous remark that it's one of the happy incidents of the federal system that a single courageous state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country.